going to be live in five, four, three, two. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to Devil's Been Talking Radio. I am Joe, and that awesome guy over there with an awesome mohawk is. You don't have a mohawk, do you? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, sick Chuck. Actually, Judge Chuck, who is sick. But Chuck. we're going to be doing pretty well today. Okay, awesome. All right, Mark, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. I wanted to do in a bio, and I plan on still doing a bio on our website. But um, me and Chuck both found out that there is a conspiracy on the Internet against finding out anything about you. <laughs> Wait, a conspiracy so, about finding anything about me? Yes, I'm dead serious. Ask Chuck, right, Chuck? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I'm, I'm about as open book. Now, that being said – I, I do consider myself an open book, but when it comes to the information that has been out there on the internet, I waited a while before I, I before I just put myself out there. So there wasn't a yeah. lot on me until about two years ago, and then now there's a whole bunch. So. Oh, there was there was absolutely a whole bunch about you, and now when we look for you, there's nothing. What are you serious? Nothing. I'm dead. I'm dead freaking serious. Like me and Chuck were talking about this before the interview, and uh, there, there is nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. It's like Google decided we hate Mark Sargent. Wow, that's that. Hey, that's news to me because nobody's told. But I mean, how many people have been looking me up specifically recently? That's weird. Well, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look at that now. Hopefully, well, that's not the case. Thing. Well, since the beginning of the year, with all the whole so-called fake news. Stuff that they that's been going all over the you know across the major networks and everything. Yeah. I think Google's taking it upon itself to take anything off that they think is fake news. <laughs> yeah, it's tied to, to that. Apparently, I mean, I'm not saying that's the case. It's just you know, I mean, they're taking anything off. I think they actually took. I think uh, one of our past people were talking about that too about um, the medical tyranny. Yeah, uh, yeah, taking off a lot of her stuff hmm. as well. One of our guests, Danielle Harrison, we had her two guests before you, and finding anything that was alternative news source. I almost said no source because Chuck is currently sneezing into a handkerchief. No. Um, <laughs> but news source, well, yeah, anything anything that's considered fake news is taken off of Google. Google is so. Did you know you're a Satan? Did you know that? Uh, a, a Satanist or just a Satan? You're you're a huge Satan. <laughs> really? No, I did not know this stuff. I mean, I don't I don't mind too much because as long as the movement, as long as the community is benefiting, is keeps going forward. I, I don't care if if people say. I mean, people said bad things about me literally since the first month, and I, I have to blame Eric Debay a little bit for that because he was the he was the one that the, I think was the first one. I said, "Oh, Mark's totally a shill, totally a disinfo agent, works for the government." Blah blah blah. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, it's, things like that will stick if you keep going. I mean, he he made his enemies list. I hope one day he takes it down, which is on the International Flat Earth Research Society, you know, where where he is king of. And I am number one with a bullet on that on that enemies list. There's like 14 people on it, and I I've, I've still to this day have never attacked him, never done anything horrible. And he's like, oh, Mark's the most horrible person in the world. It's like, come on, man, give. Eh, it doesn't really matter. So do you, so what, as far as my bio goes, because you can't find anything, what do you, what do you want to know? Uh, tell us anything, everything about you, sir. Uh, okay. I was, let's see if I can do this a little differently because some people are going, Oh God, not his bio again. Yeah. I, honestly, <laughs> your show up until, um, we had our, uh, Daniel Henderson show, your show show bar none was number one, oh, honestly. Cool. Awesome. And so that was super cool. And, uh, and, and that was super exciting because to be honest with you up until we had it, okay, here's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> here's how it goes on. Our, we have a, um, podcast syndication network that we're part of. It's called Libsyn. So our first month that we did podcasting, me and Chuck, because we didn't know what we were doing. We kind of sucked at it. We had eight downloads. Cool, whatever. <laughs> then our second month, <laughs> eight. That was it. Yeah, magic you have to start number. somewhere, right? Yeah. And so it was eight downloads. So I was like, Hallelujah! <laughs> we've had eight downloads. Well, 
Awesome. And then our second month, we had 326. And then you came on our third month, and we had 590. And ever since then, right now we're approaching the 1,000 download mark. Nice. But um, ever since that point, the podcast that we did with you had the most amount of downloads in a single month. And also, we had the most amount of listeners. So whoever is listening to you, also listen to us. And it also helped us extremely well. That's great. So, um, yeah. So thank you for coming oh, on. I'm more, that was more than happy to. I rarely will I turn down an, an interview. And just, I mean, I'm, I'm here to get the word out. That's, that's my role here is just spread the word. <laughs> testify. Go to church. So that's what I, that's what I do. And I don't, I don't really care. I mean, the, and there's something people say, well, you know, if, if, would you go on the Alex Jones show if they asked you? And I go, unfortunately, yeah, I would. I would go on the Alex Jones show because yes. you can't, you can't, there's certain, you can't put a price tag on publicity in some cases. You, you, you've got to, you've got to take where you got to take it where now, as long as you're not compromising what you're doing. Where you know, we're, and it will go over some of this stuff as we're as we're moving forward. But anyway, let's let's do the bio real quick. Yeah, okay, let's go so ahead and do that. I was, you guys can look this up. I was born in Seattle, Washington, and my family moved to Whidbey, W H I D B E Y Island, in the northwest of the United States, in the state of Washington. And that's where I was raised. I was I was went through the entire public school system in South Whidbey, and you can look this up. There's actually w during my heyday, I when I the my senior year, uh, I played basketball and I I made the paper because I had a double double in the state tournament, and so you could, you could probably find me. There's a little blip on that, but after that, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really much on me. And then I, what did I do? I went to Washington State University, drank my freshman year into oblivion. It was horrible. It didn't didn't go well. And so then I went to, I took a year off and then went to Western Washington University up in Bellingham, Washington, which is right near the Canadian border. And I made fireworks on campus and had a whole bunch of people working for me. And was, Wait, wasn't that, wasn't that illegal? <laughs> yes, it was extremely illegal, but there was, there was some, there was some money in it and I was good at chemistry and, and I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of chemistry. Let's put it that way. So I manufactured distributed explosives without a license and that got me into some trouble with the government, which is a whole nother story. You guys can watch it. Uh, there's, there's some videos on my YouTube channel. It's the, the video is called fireworks. You can't miss it. And I go into some detail. I think I was having a couple of drinks while I was doing it. And then part, so part of my <laughs> community service was teaching kids computers because my, my mother was a career teacher. And so I got to teach computers to kids as part of my most of the time you can't get a community service gig like that you're picking up trash on the side of the road type stuff but i got to actually work in a computer lab and because of that i was playing a lot more games than normal and played a computer pinball tournament back in the uh, mid 90s called crystal caliburn it was a worldwide tournament it lasted the entire year i won it it did, was not easy and Part of my prize was to test video games for this company. It was like, yeah, that's my prize. I'm going to beta test for you, really. So I wrote him a scathing review on one of their new games. And the developer, who was out of Tokyo, he said, you know what? This guy's spot on. He goes, we got to make all these changes. And then I, I'd never been to Colorado in my life. And they flew me out during a snowstorm. Thought I really thought I'd landed in the wrong airport. I, I thought I'd landed in somewhere in Anchorage, Alaska. And it was, and they hired me on the spot, and I spent the next 20 years in Colorado going back and forth between playing games for a living and teaching people proprietary software. And that's what I did when I was out in Colorado, up until very recently. And that was, that's where I got into the whole conspiracy thing. I never got married, never had kids, so I had a lot of downtime. A lot of the time to, you know, get go down the, the YouTube rabbit holes, and that's how I got into flat earth which you know i'm sure you guys put in the title somewhere i am and you know, there's lots of people out there especially recently that celebrities will say oh I, I might believe in flat earth i dabble in flat earth i'm one of those guys look i am a flat earther 
a strong flat earther. As a matter of fact, I try to do my best to inspire other flat earthers to become public flat earthers. And that's what I do. And you're going, well, okay, now this guy's completely gone off the rails. I get playing video games for a living. I get do, you know, building fireworks. You know, that, oh, that's perfectly normal, right? But, but, but doing the flat earth thing, that's insane. And I thought the same thing as well. And I will, I will try to appall. I'm coming up with different intros for this. It, it, I try, try that <laughs> out. And this one, this one is goes something like this. I apologize in advance. I know that some people listening to this right now are getting really angry at the thought that somebody believes in a flat earth. And you got to ask yourself before you pick up the phone and start calling people or posting on your blog or making a YouTube video about it, why you're getting angry in the first place. Because, and I don't know what sort of questions you've got, so you can stop me from rambling anytime. But here's here's the the thing I want to put out there. It's something new. I'm, I think I'm going to do a clue on this, and that is, okay. Eventually, if you ask a hundred people on the street why they believe the Earth is a globe, a sphere, a ball, don't say that it's round, right? That that's the wrong word for it. A dinner plate is round. A pizza is round, right? The the tire on your car is round. How do you know it's a globe? Sooner or later, everyone is going to fall back on the crutch that is NASA. Or you, you want to pick another space program. If you're not in the United States, that's fine. You pick JAXA or the European Space Agency or India or China or whatever. But, but eventually, you're going to lean on NASA. I'm going, okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's the right answer. Eventually, you're going to, you're going to go to NASA. Well, NASA took the picture. I'm going, okay. But that picture wasn't released until 1972. It's not like we didn't know it was a ball until 1970. We didn't wake up one morning in 1972 and see the picture and say, like, oh, you know, good thing we got that because I was really worried for a while. How did you know before 1972 that it was a sphere? How did you know it was a ball? And eventually you're going to have to come back to the argument, which is why the flat earth is, is one of the reasons anyway it's been getting a lot of traction is that what did science tell you back in the day that convinced you that it was a sphere? Or did they tell you anything? Or did you just remember the globe in your classroom when you were in six years old? Because everyone knows, I mean, there's globes everywhere. And since it stuck with you since you were six years old and everyone knows with childlike logic that authority doesn't lie to you, your parents don't lie to you, politicians don't lie to you, governments don't lie. Science definitely doesn't lie. How do you know? How, where did you make your leap of faith? Because that's what it comes down to. And you say, well, okay, no, I'm going to go back to NASA. NASA showed us the picture. I'm going, oh, well, you could do that. But NASA is DOD. They're the United States Department of Defense. They're United States military. Yeah, fine, they wear white uniforms and they smile for the camera. They don't carry guns and, and that's some fun stuff. And they look like they should be on the Star Trek set. But... <laughs> they they are they are DOD. I mean, they're formed on the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Werner von Braun should have been prosecuted and, and executed as a war criminal for, for doing what he did with the Nazis, with the V2 program. But when you're that intelligent, there's a use for you. He's too useful to kill. So you bring him on as part of our rocket program, and, and there you go. I'm just saying that you say, well, what's that got to do with anything? I'm just going, well, don't, don't think for a second that science will not, I'm not going to necessarily say lie outright to you, but certain people in, in positions of power would if, if, if it benefited them. Anyway, that's my, that's my opening line. So I am, I am Mark <laughs> Sargent. There's my backstory. I'm a flat earther. Come get me. And I know it's not a call-in show. It's not, right? There. Well, no, not yet. And we're working on the whole okay. video feed thing. That's like the very next thing, like literally the next step. Oh, well, that's good because it, normally after I say that, then if, if you have a switchboard, the calls just, I mean, the, <laughs> it just lights up. I did a, I did an interview for one of Eminem's podcasts and it's not Eminem. Wait, are we talking about the Eminem rapper? Yeah. Or... Yeah. 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 Really? It's the, yeah. The, the podcast was called Shady. No 40. way. Oh yeah. 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 Shady 45 and I can't remember the name of the host it's like a weird name it, like he's got a, a literally a, a derogatory name like vicious <laughs> it's like a, anyways you can look it up Shady 45 and right. we're about 10 minutes and the interview only lasted like 30 minutes anyway and we're in about right. 10 minutes and the phone lines are just blowing up 
And you could tell he is freaking out. He's so excited because people are just calling in. It's like, oh, I want a piece of this guy because these are. This is a hip hop station, you know. This is this is so the people. This is I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say this. How do you know? <laughs> oh yeah, it's like, oh no, man, you are whacked. You know, you gotta go back to playing video games. You, I, I'm doing a terrible black person. What's wrong here. with you? But they were just coming at me. And I mean, vicious. And, and again, the, I have to circle back to why are you getting upset about this? It's a weird topic. I could bring up any other topic I wanted to you. I, I mean, you know, controversial topics like, I don't know, abortion, church versus state, stem cell research, gay rights, women's rights, black rights. I could bring up any of these things. Right? You're not going to get as upset as you do with flat earth. And that doesn't make sense because flat earth, it should be so ridiculous that you just kind of wave it off. And the right. reason why people get so upset about it is the, uh, the, the, the term, there's a couple different terms. One is cognitive dissonance and the other would be, uh, which I heard the other day on an old interview was called reality bias. And that is your reality is based on a certain thing. And all of a sudden I'm coming in and I'm saying the world that you're standing on may not be that. And that's tough because it's, it's something you can't just kick out of your head right away. It's not like 9-11. If you don't want to think about 9-11, don't think about 9-11. You, it's not going to affect your daily life. But if somebody comes right. in and says, oh, yeah, by the way, you may be living in the Truman Show. Ooh, that messes with people's heads. And they don't right. know what to do a lot of the time. So, yeah, I, I've heard it. Anyway, the, the end of that Shady, Shady 45 interview was hilarious because they just – he, he did not have it. He could have spent the next two hours taking calls. And they all, and, these were, and, and this was a station that screened calls. These were the screened ones that got through. Apparently, the, the other ones that didn't get through were completely incoherent ramblings where they, they just wanted a, a piece of me. I mean, literally wanted a piece of me. It's like, don't shoot the messenger, man. I'm, I'm just here spreading the word. Chuck. Well, just had a kind of weird saying that I totally – Escapes me what I was thinking right there. It's like, huh? <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry. Yeah, my, this cold is just real fresh. It just started in the second half of yesterday. So I apologize. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. It was a good thing you told me yeah. that, that you were, that it was a cold because otherwise I thought you were doing Coke or something. <laughs> well, at least that was, well. Uh, well it's oh, I'm sorry. Doing that. more Coke. He does, uh, he does piles uh, of it. Coca Cola, it. yeah. Yeah. The, the original. He's got the dehydrated Coca Cola in his closet. <laughs> right. Hey, I, I got a quick story for you. Because people, sure. people, people will, uh, they say, well, you know, there's urban myths and there's, there's things that aren't true anymore. <sighs> And when I was doing proprietary software, I was talking to a company out of, I think actually it was Raleigh, North Carolina, go small world. That's the, the same city we're going to do the conference in this, this fall, the Flat Earth International Conference. And it was a company called R.R. Donnelly. And one of the things they did was they made high fructose corn syrup for Coca-Cola. And I was talking to these guys and, I, you know, I was a little bit into conspiracies, but not that much. And I was going, oh yeah, right. I remember... When uh, when Coke used to put in you know real cocaine you know the, the name on the on the side of the can you know it's Coca Cola it's cocaine yeah. and I remember they used to actually put cocaine and the guy pauses what do you mean used to I go what are you talking about <laughs> he's going well, he goes what he goes he goes we use coca leaves when we make the high fr fructose corn syrup the only difference is is that it's trace amounts trace amounts that the FDA will allow. But it's so traced that we don't even have to put it on the side of the label. I was going, get the hell out of here. He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, man. In fact, <laughs> in fact when we're making the, the fructose syrup, we have so much residue left over. It's basically low-grade cocaine. There's so much of it that we have to put it in, in big bags and put it in a locked vault. And, and the, uh, the FBI comes every month and, and takes it out of there. And takes it, takes it with him. <laughs> I go, what do they do with it? He goes, I have no idea. I'm not going to ask. The you know, FBI like, is think, like, I love working for the FBI. Yeah, it's, I, like, okay. You think they destroy it. But it was one of those things going, wow, the little things you, you don't know. We've heard, you know, all the stories going years and years back. And we think that we just don't do those things anymore. But it's the, one of my favorite quotes is that the, it's, it's a great quote, which is things are never what they first appear to be. 
meaning uh, you know Thomas Jefferson, the second president of the United States. He he owned he was a slave owner, big time slave owner. Uh, John Wayne smoked a lot of dope, you know, even though he played you know, the, the, the quintessential Western straight laced guy. Nice. And uh, uh, not, I'm not, sure he and uh, Willie Nelson were pretty good friends then. The West, <laughs> yeah, he and, he and Willie Nelson were pretty good friends. Then. I there love go. Willie Nelson. <laughs> uh, not, think, look, like like um, do you remember the old show? Yeah, I'm sure you do. The old show Night Rider with Kit the car. Oh, heck yeah. yeah. That was yeah. my favorite show. Yeah, that show was supposed to be a Saturday morning kids show. And it and it scored so well, they bumped it to prime time. But that's how yeah, little yeah, faith. You yeah, know, yeah. you never know. It, producers looked at it. It's like, eh, it'll be fine. We'll put it on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And who's, who's going to care? <laughs> and, right. and all of a sudden, it made David Hasselhoff a, a, a legend. Basically could, a god. And basically he's a god, yeah. essentially. He, could, could, yeah. he just fell into, it's into, David fell into money. Hooray! It's like, oh, Sorry. yeah, okay, what, you're done with the Knight Rider thing. What are you doing now? I don't know, some stupid lifeguard show. <laughs> Turns out to be <laughs> the most popular I'm... international show of all time. But, you know, yeah. big shocker why. they weren't paying, People weren't paying to see him. He had the easiest gig at all. Of all, yeah, these breasts don't bother me at all. Yeah, so. <laughs> every teenage boy's uh, favorite show at the time, I'm sure. Yeah, what <laughs> was that? I was I was reading an article about a guy. His favorite show to watch was Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got a movie of the same name coming out. Oh dang, <laughs> that's yeah. terrible. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so what's uh, what, what do you guys want? What do you want to talk about? Well, there was a. I'm actually going to title this podcast "Rise of the Flat Earth" with Mark Sargent. Oh, okay. And the reason why, and, and there's a very specific reason why, and that is, holy crap, Flat oh. Earth is becoming so multimedia slash mainstream media mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. Yeah, it is it's... so talked about right now. It's ridiculous. And every time I thought saw, I, we're talking ESPN. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It, mainstream. We're it, talking like ridiculous. We're talking ABC Morning News. We're talking about it's on the Huffington Post. Oh, like it, it was, is yeah. absolutely ridiculous how Flat Earth has just surged in the main me oh, stream media. I, believe me, I've been so unbelievably busy for the last three weeks. And it's only been three, three, has it three weeks ago? It's a little under a month, basically. Yeah, let me, the, yeah. the first thing that came out, so I did Strange World 92. Yeah, that was three weeks ago. And I just finished 95. And the so something happened on that, I knew it was going to be a weird week anyway, because that Wednesday, there was a Los Angeles television station which reported that somebody, a flat earther, had carved into a hill in Riverside, California, which is in Los Angeles, 10-foot-high letters, Google Flat Earth, in, into the hillside. Nice. And it was brilliant how he did it. He just put on a, a, a hard hat, a orange reflective thing, and a shovel, and he just went up on the hillside, and he carved it in, and nobody questioned him because he owned it. it you know, he, owned, he looked like he was supposed to be there. And, you know, then, then by the time he was done, you know, people took pictures of it. And you're thinking, well, that's pretty good. I'm going, well, that's, for me, that's a great week anyway. The fact that, that mainstream news, it was covered on CBS. And then two days later, Kyrie Irving, the, the, the world's current ranking point guard in, in the National Basketball Association, world champs, current world champs for the Cleveland Cavaliers, He's flying on his way to the All-Star Game with his friend and teammate Richard Jefferson. And I can't remember the woman's name. And they were kind of doing a podcast. It was Richard Jefferson's podcast, I'm pretty sure. And he was like a, like a co-host. And, and you can tell both these guys are conspiracy guys. And I should have known. I hate to say this, but I should have known beforehand that per certain sect of, of professional athletes are going to be more prone to that, mainly the guys that have to do a lot of road trips. So with, with the NFL, with football, you're only making, what, seven road trips a year? But with basketball and baseball, you're making a whole bunch of road trips. You're flying all the time, which means you're going to be watching movies and watching television shows and, of course, going down YouTube rabbit holes, which will lead you into dark and sinister places. So these two guys were definitely into all sorts of conspiracies and both of them were into flat earth and Richard Bates Kyrie into it. And he spent a good 15 minutes of that podcast, just laying it out. 
and not not great details, but it, enough to where he was, was like, look, it's flat, it's flat. He just kept repeating it, it's flat, and he believed it. And Richard, and you could tell that Richard was, you know, he wasn't trolling him. Richard wanted him to say this. Here's the thing, though. He's landing at the All-Star game, and, you know, before the All-Star game, you've got media day, and uh, professional athletes are notorious for giving horribly boring interviews. They, they are, because it is, I'm not saying the athletes are dumb. I'm just saying they're trained to say certain things. You say the same right. stuff. Well, we gave it 110%, and our team did real well, and the other team was good. I don't have anything against them, and our coaching was excellent. Blah, 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 blah. We've all heard it a million times, right? So yeah. when a guy hits the tarmac and you've got him on audio, not hearsay, not secondhand, you've got him on audio saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I think the earth's flat. Oh, God. It was, it was, it was like Christmas came early for the media. They couldn't, be, couldn't have been happier. So you have media day where you sit down, the, all your players, the, for the All-Star game, because there's not that many people in the All-Star game. And you've got Kyrie Irving, and right next – I mean, honestly, I – I almost screamed like a little girl when I, when I watched this because because <laughs> LeBron James, the probably the most recognizable athlete in the world right now, he's sitting within what ten feet from Kyrie doing his own press booth, and he just decides on his own he's gonna you know because they ask they're asking other players about Kyrie. It's not like you're just gonna ask Kyrie. You're gonna ask other players what they think about what Kyrie said. It, it's too good to pass up. And and LeBron's going, you know what? He's going, hey, you know, is the earth flat? And, and uh, Kyrie's going, yeah, that's news. And, and, and LeBron is not going to come down on him because, well, he's your championship point guard. He helped you get the title. And he's your right-hand man. He calls him his little brother. And all, and that point, it just started. The, the firestorm began. And uh, let's see. I'm just going through the videos that I produced over the last three weeks. Uh, Draymond Green, also in the All-Star game. Place with the Golden State Warriors. He, you could tell, you're talking to him. He's also down the YouTube rabbit hole. He's like, oh yeah, yeah. And we had just announced during this, j the the previous week, we had just announced the Flat Earth International Conference for 2017. We had just announced it in Raleigh, North Carolina. So you couldn't, and which once this firestorm started up, the VIP tickets, at least the first batch of VIP tickets, sold out within a week for that for that conference. Dang. It was, wow, it was nice, just fan freaking tastic. Let's see. LeBron James asked Kyrie Irving, and then CNN does, did an article. Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, and why a flat Earth is okay. <laughs> That's CNN. Uh, then, then of course they had to start digging out people. So one of the first people they dug up was Bill Nye. Oh God, just, Bill Nye. Uh, where, where, where should I go with him? Yeah, Bill how Nye. does he even figure into anything? Because that guy, is, as far as I know, he's not even a real scientist. He is not yeah, a real scientist. He is, he, yeah. is, he started out as an actor in Seattle. He wasn't even a Hollywood actor. And he did a little skit for a company called, uh, a little skit group called Almost Live. And he was recommended by Ross Schaefer, the guy that ran the show who said, look, why don't you, he goes, you kind of look like a nerd. Why don't you put a bow tie on and a jacket and do some science experiments? That segued into doing a thing for PBS where he was Bill Nye the Science Guy, which was then resurrected by Disney, also called Bill Nye the Science Guy. Hmm. But here's, here's where it gets weird. Then, uh, because you got to remember, he's, he's only got a, mat, uh, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Which has nothing to do with science. Well, it has nothing to do with it. And people say, well, mechanical engineering, science. I was going, well, yeah, but it has nothing to do with meteorology or cosmology or quantum mechanics or biology or hydrology or any other panels that he's invited to be on just because right. he says he's a science guy. Now, he's just a guy hmm. that talks about science. So the title is actually quite, quite literal. But it was, oh, it's just amazing. When you look at his backstory... He gets literally invited on he, Larry King Live. Let's have him talk about global warming. Let's let's have him be the subject matter expert on who wants to be a millionaire. I'm not making any of this stuff up. This is stuff that he does on a regular basis. Yeah, he's on a panel that's uh, uh, called the Planetary Society. He's like one of the like the v, uh, high ranking member of the Planetary Society. He helped design a sundial that was supposedly was on the Mars rover goes on and on and on and it's just because of what i call journalistic laziness which is okay fine you don't want to take a chance calling an actual geologist or a climatologist or somebody who specializes in meteorology at the local college because you don't know how he's going to be on camera with bill you know 
he'll at least fake his way through it. But you don't put that disclaimer anywhere. You don't. People look at him as going, "Well, he must be. He, he must specialize in meteorology. He must f specialize in quantum mechanics. Why is he even sitting on a panel with Neil deGrasse Tyson? Why? How, why is he there at all? He, he, why do you have your? Why is he and Obama and Neil deGrasse Tyson have have doing selfies together? I'm. Well, I know why. Because because he's he looks famous. the part. People <laughs> thinks think he's credible because he looks credible. That's it. You know, he literally might as well be one of the cast members from Revenge of the Nerds. That's it. That's, right. That's all, that's all <laughs> so anyway, sorry. I know I'm not, I, I know I'm dragging this out, but I, I I'm sorry, I hate Bill Nye the science guy. I hate him. I, I completely agree with you. And the yeah. sad thing is I was a huge fan when I was like four. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> didn't know any better back then, though. That's the thing. Bill Nye, the science guy. Yeah, lots Bill, of people Bill, think. Bill. Yeah, in fact, I feel that some people will say, "Well, it's sad because I really liked him as a kid." I'm going, "Yeah, okay." Does that mean though that he should be talking about the uh, the evolution and how how stars are formed and all that? Why are you asking him questions like this? Right. He knows he knows jack about all. I mean, yeah, he was a mechanical engineer, and he got apparently he wasn't very good at it because he went into acting almost immediately. <laughs> the, he worked for Boeing for a very short time. If, anyway, so the right. point the point I'm getting here is they dragged him into the fray. It's like, well, what's your opinion on the flat Earth? Why does he have an opinion on the flat Earth at all? And Sports hey, you guy that has no idea what you're talking about at all, tell me about the flat Earth. Yeah. Exactly. Really? The flat Earth? The Earth is flat? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't and, know that. His, <laughs> right? Stuff like that. His arguments were, were horrible, but but Sports Illustrated, when they call you, you know, you're, you're going to take the call. And he did it from his house. Then right. I'm, I'm just going to rattle off the shows on ESPN. Just about every daily show or weekly show that does anything on ESPN <laughs> covered it. So Sports Nation, that was a big one. Uh, the Jump, that's a basketball show. The first take, I mean, I watched first take on a regular basis for years. Uh, 120 Sports, which is uh, not ESPN, but a different one. And then, hang on. And then Joe Rogan brings Neil deGrasse Tyson on because the, you, he had to. He, he was going to have to address it. Then an interesting little side note, AJ Styles, the wrestler for, for WWE, he, he he's getting ha ha harassed by his friend on camera, you know, on his show that he's in flat earth and, and he, but he'd say, no, no, I'm not a flat earther, but I know stuff about flat earth and I don't think you can handle it. That type of stuff, which is interesting. And then <clears throat> TMZ gets Neil deGrasse Tyson at his house on Skype baked out of his freaking mind. Don't know why they let him you know, talk to people. And, and, and he goes on and says that Kyrie should stick to basketball and that he shouldn't be talking about any of this stuff. He, she, he should keep Flat Earth away from science and NASA and all this. And basically, he, Kyrie should just not talk about anything that isn't basketball. Oh, geez. Oh, then it went on uh, Bill, Ma Bill Maher's show, which had, <laughs> one of his guest guys was Seth MacFarlane, you know, the creator of Family Guy and American Dad, you know, big talent. And they were just trolling the hell out of him. ESPN Radio, Mike and Mike went on, Fox Dish, Dish Nation, they went after him. And during during all the, this, I mean, I literally was having a hard time keeping up. I was having, you know, because you have to edit stuff out, uh, you know, you're, you're putting in, it. There was, there was a lot of editing on my side. I had to make sure I was, I was getting just the right parts. Then, as this is happening, and, and I'm just looking at the videos. It's amazing how many videos were cranked out in such a short amount of time. Oh yeah, uh, Richard Jefferson does, talks Kyrie and Flat Earth on Fox Sports, and you could actually see the the two people that were in the original podcast on that. And that was a local Fox Sports show out of Cleveland, Ohio. Just didn't know what to do because look, they won the championship, but your point, your star point guard, thinks he's a flat earther. So what are you going to do? They, they didn't know. So then SpaceX makes this weird announcement. Did you hear this one? Actually, you know, I was going to uh, – I had actually talked to uh, Chuck about this. Um, is this where you're talking about how they want to be the first un, uh, unmilitarized uh, um, space um, private program, pro private company to Go launch to the, to the moon? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh it's, it's better than that, though, Matt. It is that they came out and said – and it is the, one of the most outrageous claims I've ever heard – in the history of, of science technology, they are going to take two tourists on a slingshot path ar around the moon and back. 
and and they're going to do this next year, meaning you know, literally a year from now they're going to send tourists around the moon. Huh. And I'm I'm looking, and they're saying, well, you know, the timeline's somewhat aggressive. I was like, aggressive? Are you kidding me? Do you realize the 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 steps that have to things that have to fall in line for you even attempt such a thing? First of all, what booster rocket are you using to go to the moon? Because last time I checked, the Saturn V system hasn't been replicated in a long time. Two, so you've got a, a rocket system. They're going to use the Falcon rocket system. Never been tested. They're going to use oh. the, uh, uh, the a capsule system, which apparently has never even been designed. And what capsule system are you going to use? Because up until now, the most people that NASA has even claimed that they've sent around the moon is three people. So if two of them are tourists, you're not going to send three people. You're going to probably send a crew of at least four and maybe five. What capsule system is that? That's never even been so attempted. Are right. we talking about Moon Express or uh, uh, SpaceX, or are they the same space, thing? Spa SpaceX. I Moon Express. Okay, I a, a different thing. Space I have a um, article right here from www.techcrunch.com. Oh joy. Um, and it says Moon Express. Yeah, right. Uh, it says Moon Express has officially become the first private company in the world to receive permission to travel beyond Earth's orbit. After months of conversation with government officials. The company received the green light from FAA to venture to the moon in 2017. Oh, no, no. That's going to be part oh, okay. That's a whole different thing. So, there so here's the, here's the question. Cause I know you've got a lot of knowledge and holy crap. I know because I've been monitoring cause I'm subscribed to you on YouTube. <laughs> you've got so many interviews going on right now. Uh, I do. Um, yeah, like ridiculous. I was actually surprised when you agreed to come on our show. I was oh, like, dang, yeah, this guy is getting popular. So we appreciate it once again. Oh, but um, what – so why – this was a question that I had. Why, if why, um, you know, there's a firmament and the last time we talked about there's a firmament, we're not really sure necessarily – what kind of shape it takes or what kind of substance it's made out of or yeah. anything like that. We just know there's a firmament according to the flat earth theory. Right. Um, and if the earth is flat, and I say if for the question, sure. if the earth is flat, um, why are they making such a big push? Because we've got SpaceX, then we have Moon Express, then we talk, have Obama was talking about going to the moon and to Mars. Yeah. Um, why are they pushing so hard um, for these uh, um, explorations if, in fact, there is a firmament and of, we can't get past it? One of, one of, two, way, one of two reasons. Uh, the first would be, depending on how you look at it, you could say that it's a last-ditch effort for them to just do globe conditioning. No different than the face on Mars, the hexagon on Saturn, or, oh, look, we're going to reclassify Pluto again. You know, stuff like that. None of those stories matter. The, it's the subtext which matters. And that is, you're thinking about Mars from a globe. Everything, every story that's out in space reinforces the globe. So that's, that's the first one. But you could go the other way and say that they're trying to disclose it, which means you run more space stories. Eventually, you're going to find the links that lead you back to what I'm doing. Because the SpaceX thing, there's two things that are happening right now. One is the Google, the Moon Express, I'm pretty sure, is part of the Google X Challenge, which is... Yeah, um, yes, you're absolutely right about that. The, yeah, uh, they get $3 yeah. million dollars Tw in no, no, $20 million. $20 million. Is it $20 million? $20 okay. million bucks. It, And there's a second prize of, I think, five. It's called Lunar X Prize. There, there you go. Lunar X Prize. So the, the prize is that you send a probe to the moon. The first person to send a probe to the moon, land it, beam back pictures from the moon. And five companies have taken up the challenge. And two, I think, are American. One is Japanese. One is European. One is Indian, which sounds about right. Here's the problem. It, it, you're, 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 if you're going to write it as a story, not all five obviously are going to make it. Two, one would probably blow up on the pad. One would would die as soon as they were trying to leave Earth. Of course, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> if you right. please, just, you know, one, two, one, one doesn't make it to the moon. Two actually make it, and then one broadcasts back. 
You know, they, they, it, it, maybe they're American, maybe they're not. But it doesn't matter because the pictures are going to be so grainy that you can cop out. You can you can make it seem like the the pictures that they've been releasing recently, which are horrible, horrible CGI images. What the SpaceX thing though? That's a whole different animal. Meaning, you have no excuse at this point if you're sending people around the moon. If you believe this, this mission hasn't even been attempted in fifty years. So, I mean, since Apollo 17, back back in 1972. So, what, what, what did, how exactly are you going to work those cameras? Because nowadays, it's not like 72. Now we've got 4K cameras, and they're cheap, and they're small. You can put them everywhere. There's no excuse not to have streaming footage during the entire mission. Streaming footage. Right. Both ways, looking at the moon and leaving Earth, which you, you're you asking them to produce images, a series of images that have never been produced by NASA in the history of NASA. Meaning there is there is no photograph, there is no there are no movies of any object leaving the pad and leaving Earth, leaving Earth orbit or coming back. There is no movies of the Earth rotating on its axis with the weather morphing. There is, even though now you can find a, a picture with the weather morphing, but the Earth isn't rotating, or you can find it rotating, but the but the, but the weather isn't morphing. Why they don't use a supercomputer to create both, I have no I have no idea. <laughs> There's again, and some of this is 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 a rehash from last time. There is no footage of any astronaut outside of a space capsule or any outside of anything where he turns at least 180 degrees or further, meaning just turn around with the camera running. It's never happened. Gemini, Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, ISS, never, ever happened. People are, people say, no, no, the inside of the ISS. I'm going, no, outside, outside of the spacecraft. Never, ever happened. There's not even a, a decent movie, as far as I can uh, tell, of any astronaut inside an airlock, opening the airlock and following them out. Look, 4K cameras are super cheap and easy and durable, and, and they and it never, ever happened. So you're basically asking SpaceX to break all of these rules. There's a reason why none of these things have been produced so far, and that is because you can't. You can't fake it. There's a reason why from 1972 until the summer of 2015, there was only one full picture of the Earth in sunlight ever, ever taken. Literally. You can look this up. It's not like it's a secret information. The White House, we knew this because the White House released the second one. Scott Kelly wrote the article and supposedly helped process the picture. And 43 years, 1972 until 2015, 43 years, nobody took a picture of the Earth in sunlight. How is that even possible? Hubble, no satellite, none of the other space programs. You'd think it'd be kind of a good picture to take. Never have ever happened. We, we also know this because the first iPhone, if you guys remember the, the first iPhone, the image was the background yeah. was the Earth, the blue marble shot. And Scott Simmons, they had to hire a NASA consultant to produce that image, to create that image from scratch. And he went on and he was interviewed and said, oh, yeah, I had to, it, it was Photoshopped, but it had to be. I had to create that image from scratch yeah, because there was no other images to grab. All these things which should have been there aren't. And you're asking SpaceX to break all these rules in one mission to do this. It's never, ever going to happen. You might as well, it might as well be, and it's, it's, it's supposed to happen next year. You have painted yourself into a corner. Uh, you, you're going to have to kick that can down the road. You're, you're going to have to delay the mission for years and that, just make sure it never happens. It's just it's yeah. ridiculous. It's a, uh, you know, why even make a goal like that? If you're not going to make it, you know exactly. what I mean? <clears throat> it's not a, it's not a public company. So I, it was like, why are you doing it to boost stock prices? No, SpaceX is not a public company. So, and, and you'd think you would, would be, you know, people are opportunists. You'd think people would want to invest in SpaceX. Thing is, if you make it public, then the big investors, like, like big producers in a movie, they have certain rights. They can go backstage. They can, they can look at some of your stuff close up and they don't want that. So SpaceX, but utter piece of crap. They're just as bad as NASA are. No. <laughs> That's great. And Chuck, <laughs> anything you want to say? Well, just uh, uh, sound like someone else that we had on the show that was kind of saying the same thing about a lot of the stuff in the lunar landings and everything. But um, I do have a <clears throat> second question. Sure. On with that firmament and everything else too. Yeah. Um, what would you? Um, how would you explain like a meteor crater uh, up here at night? I, uh, Winslow, 
um, or any other meter or even uh, shooting stars for that instance. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Where no, that's, the, that's, where that's, the that's, firmament's concerned. That, that's a good question because it leads into something else. Cause yeah, because I was, I was Sorry. just at the meteor crater and I believe that's Flagstaff or Winslow. I can't uh, remember. It's, um, I you think mean the big, the a, big crater in Arizona? Yeah, yeah, I was just there. Meteor and crater. They Got have it. all this crap talking about how, you know, I'm not – Logic, in my opinion, logical sense tells me that the meteor crater is not two million years old, and and it only comes down to, <clears throat> excuse me, it only comes down to the fact that degradation and uh, issues like that come into play um, when you're talking about two million years old. Like there's a lot of things that should not be that are that would have already eroded or degraded. If, the, in fact, that meteor crater was 2 million years old, but it's a mile across. Yeah, right. And Chuck brought up to me before we had even talked about, had even talked about having you on the show. And he's like, man, he's like, if there is no firmament, or if there's a firmament, I mean, if there's a firmament, how do they explain a meteor crater a mile across? I was gotcha. like, that's a good question. <laughs> The the ferment can be looked at, but it le it's it's a good question because it leads into something else, which is I believe the big craters, the really big craters, like like of course the one in Arizona and the the bigger one that helped form the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I was right about that. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those I believe predate. Well, they obviously predate us. The question is uh, because I'm a big believer that we our civilization is not the first civilization to rent this apartment that there have been other civilizations before ours and that cataclysms have happened. The question is, did the cataclysms happen during an existing civilization or were they just kind of decorative to remind us uh, of what could happen beforehand? Now, that being said, and, and by that, I mean other civilizations, you know, you look up the, the sunken cities off of Japan or the sunken cities off of India or how old the pyramids really are or the, the, the radioactive glass that's somewhere in, in India. There's all sorts of fun little things. You know, was Atlantis real? Was the continent of Mu real? Was, what it, who, who lived here when all our continents were formed together in that supercontinent called Pangaea? What version are we? Are we version seven? Are, and if we are, who the heck was version one? But I don't want to get into that right now. So when it comes to meteors, two things. One is, I, I, I don't think it conflicts with this model at all, because if you, it's a great reinforcement tool. If there is a firmament, then, in fact, my, my old co-host, Jonathan, he was the first one to suggest this. He goes, wouldn't it be just like throwing rocks into an aquarium? I go, yeah, yeah, because it'd be super easy. Just introduce a piece of metal at high speed, however way you want to introduce it, rail gun or whatever. Let friction from the atmosphere do the rest. Try not to aim at any major cities. Interesting that all the, two things here. Interesting one that none of the meteors recently in our history of our civilization, and granted it's only 5,000 years unbroken, no major meteor has ever smacked into a city or killed a major population area. You know, no, nothing's ever like we see in the movies, like Armageddon or Deep Impact or something like that. But the other one I think is way more interesting because it's technologically improbable is that we see meteor showers all the time. Everyone knows, you know, you can take pictures of meteors and look them up online. There's, there's lots of meteors that are out there and asteroids and comets and stuff like that. But the stuff that go into our atmosphere, and there's uh, meteor showers that happen every year. I think, it was, if I'm not mistaken, the Perseus is one of them, where hmm. it, it shows up and, and we're talking hundreds and hundreds of these things crisscrossing the sky. Why don't any of them ever hit any satellites? In the history of satellites, you'd think that you know, the movie Gravity with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, why it, that whole movie was based on a satellite that got smacked by something and ran out of control and started a cascade effect. And eventually that satellite ran to other satellites and the entire upper atmosphere was just a piece of uh, a series of jagged metal shards that were traveling at thousands of miles an hour. Why don't any satellites ever go down? You never hear it like AT&T lost three satellites this month. Or a television station <laughs> doesn't go down. Or your cell service doesn't go down. Or at the very least, these satellite companies don't even seem concerned. You'd think you'd retask the satellite and move it to a different place. No, they never 
they never ever move them. And it's in my opinion because they they are not what they say they are. Do I think there's objects up there? Yes. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as a satellite. I'm just not saying they're pieces of metal with solar panels attached to them. I think they're either part of the NASA high altitude balloons or they're just high altitude spy planes that are rerouting the signals. So mm. that that's that's kind of the long version of, of why what I think about meteors. But but I don't think I think it's more interesting that the meteors we don't see more catastrophes involved with meteors. That that can help. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, because I mean, you kind of went into the whole thing about satellites. I mean, I don't know how, if they've got any type of uh, um, pre-warning system showing that any of those meteor meteorites coming towards us to where they could move it. But I think you kind of went into that already about yeah I mean, stuff like they, that. You would have to move these things, and you got to remember, we're not talking about direct hit, even if they're a glancing blow. The, the, the momentum would spin those satellites so fast that you'd never be able to, 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 to correct their trajectory. Never in a million years. And then the cascade effect comes into play, which is everyone, you know, depending on which site you look up, supposedly the, the upper atmosphere is just chock full. It's a traffic jam of satellites. If one of them goes off course, you know, again, we'll take the meteors even out of this for a second. Let's say there's a mechanical failure and one goes off course and smashes into another one. Eventually, law of averages says that, you know, you're just going to keep going around the earth. They're just going to keep running into more of them. And sooner or later, all the satellites are going to fail. It is a statistical certainty that will happen. And we don't hear anything even remotely close about it. Nobody cares. Nobody worries about it. And it's because it's a, it's a great scam. They, they charge people. They build the satellites in the ground. They shoot them up into the air. They ditch them into the ocean. And then you never hear from them again. And, and you're saying, no, no, you don't know that. I'm going, well, I do. Here's why. I get a chance to talk to a company at least a year ago now out of California. They were one of the SpaceX rivals. It was called Interorbital. I got a chance to talk to the, the president and the VP. I, I, don't, I got lucked out. There was a guy from Germany that wanted to, that were friends with these guys. And I got on the conference call and I asked him because I, I suspected, I'm going, look, if you're going to fake satellites, what you're going to do is you're going to have NASA is going to, they're going to, they're going to kind of oversee your satellite launch. They're going to take over the trajectory. They're going to take over the transmissions and all the data. That's what you would do if you're NASA. That's, that's how you do it. That way, nobody knows any different. You let the people build the rockets to build the satellites, spend the money. As soon as the rocket goes out of distance, you take over the trajectory and then you can tell them whatever you want. Because it's just a data stream. That's all satellites are when you get right down to it. Right. And they say, no, we don't have to do anything with NASA. And I go, that's kind of odd. And she goes, but you know what we do have to talk to is a group called the, the Atmospheric and Transportation Safety Bureau. I go, what? What's that? And they go, oh, it's a bureau. And in fact, she said every country that has a space program has their version of this. And I go, okay, what do you have to do? And they go, well, at least six months, sometimes even longer, before the mission, before you send up whatever it is, you have to send them every detailed spec on the technology that you're using, including the payload, including the rocket, the frequencies, the whole nine yards. And that's that's exactly what you would do. You would you'd send these guys. They require everything. They know everything about your rocket. They know they know how your rocket's controlled. So at a certain point in its trajectory, they take over transmission, and it becomes a um, uh, co I'm sorry. Uh, what's the movie that where they fake the Mars mission? Uh, crap, I can't remember. It's I'm, I'm Red like Planet. That. No, no, Capricorn um... One. Capricorn One. So Cap Capricorn One scenario, because once you take over the telemetry, then nobody on the ground knows any difference. And then the people that are running the the transmission stuff at the at the base, they can you know give each other high fives, and it's great. You, then you can send them all the data you want, and that's all you need to do. And it and it's worked flawlessly, and that's what how they've done it. At the very least, even if you want to send something up there, you can simulate satellites with the high altitude balloon programs that NASA has been running since the 50s. It's great. And the GPS system, which is just a modified version of the old Loran system, L-O-R-A-N, it's, it's, it's a great, and you, and you say, no, no, it's too big. You're talking about stuff that's too big. You can't cover up this much stuff. I'm going, you can if you have a lot of time to do it and a lot of money to do it. If you start in the 50s, you start small, one satellite at a time, 
one program at a time. You can do this. It's not that hard to keep something like this a secret if you have decades to play with. If you had to do a rush job, again, why the SpaceX thing is, is ridiculous. If you have to rush something, then yeah, SpaceX is ridiculous because it can't be faked. The reason, here, here's the reason why SpaceX is going to have a huge problem. Everyone knows that the mainstream movies nowadays are massive productions, whether it's Titanic or Avatar or King Kong or whatever you want. They're big productions. Every one of these movies makes mistakes. And you can find these mistakes on, on websites like moviemistakes.com and moviebloopers.com. And there's people that have dedicated YouTube channels. And they do very well. All they do is find the mistakes. And the reason why there's mistakes is because movies and television programs are shot out of sequence. If you have to, if you've got five different desert scenes in your script, you're going to shoot all the desert scenes at the same time to save money. You get the crew out there, you shoot them all to save time and save money. That's what you do. And th because you do that, you're going to make mistakes. A coffee cup's going to move. Somebody's shirt is going to be different. Whatever it is, gonna, you know, it, we, we've all found them. I mean, heck, Lord of the Rings, the first release, there was a car driving on a road right next to one of the forest scenes and nobody caught it. Oh my gosh! I've my world has just been rocked. I never knew that. I mean, yeah, well, when I get home, I'm going to be watching. Where every, <laughs> look, look it up on YouTube. There's the greatest movie mistakes are out there because that's they, so awesome. Things are shot out of <laughs> nice. sequence. But and so what happens? What happened was people that used to spend their time looking at movies and television shows started looking at old historical things, old historical events. And which should not prove any, you know, it's look, it's real life, it's real time, or, or, or it's a historical event. There should not be any production mistakes. And slowly but surely, they started realizing that there were, that there were big production mistakes, especially in the storyline. You know, the first ones you would have to look at back in the day were, were JFK, or look at Pearl Harbor, or look at Apollo. The Apollo moon program has aged horribly. Even though Stanley Kubrick helped get him going back in the 60s, and he, you know, he was a genius when it came to details, he backed out before the, the program went live in 69. And they, they can only do so much. And they, when you look at the photographs, the still shots, the, even what they call high res, now at the moon, no, nothing adds up. There's too many question marks. And that's where, you know, na nowadays, and I, I wasn't kidding when I said this on a, on a different interview. I said that, if someone came to me and they said, look, we'll give you an unlimited budget, a blank check, and all access to all the Hollywood tech people you need, we need you to fake a mission to Mars, I'd look at them and I'd laugh and I'd walk away because I'd say there's no way I could do it. It cannot be done. Not in real time. Not in the time that you, that you need it to be done. You cannot fake a live or even simulated live transmission. There's too many production things that can go wrong. All it takes is one nerd in Nebraska at three in the morning to find something that you nobody else caught and he'll put it on YouTube or he'll, po he'll post something on it and share it on, on Facebook or Twitter and you're doomed. That's it. It's, it's done. You can't do it nowadays. And the same thing is going to happen with SpaceX. Uh, I'm sorry. This is me circling back to SpaceX and saying, look, SpaceX is a piece of crap. They're not saying <laughs> you, you absolutely hate SpaceX. <laughs> oh, spa that, SpaceX. It's just, it's just so you're, you're doing SpaceX. It's like a slap in the face to all the people at NASA who have done so much to keep this thing a secret. SpaceX is now coming. Oh, no, we're, we're totally. It's, it's, it's like, uh, I'll give you an analogy. It's like you're playing chess with somebody. And you're taking the, you, the bishop, you have a full, the bishop has a full diagonal move across the entire board, right? And you just send him over there because you can to, to the far end of the, of the board. And, and, and the other guy goes, what in the world are you doing? It's like, it's like, he's totally vulnerable. It's like, would you think you're going to be able to do anything once you're over there? No, no, it is so, it is so bold that it, it's, it's it's ridiculous it, it cannot it, they, they are i don't know what they're thinking that they're gonna have to kick it down the road next year they cannot do it either that or something big's coming down the pipe this year but so anyway. so um we've got about five minutes left okay maybe a little bit longer okay um what do you, you want to do but for well what i wanted to ask is i wanted you to define for our listeners because um as i explained before our first month and our, first, our second month, we didn't have a whole lot of uh, downloads. We didn't have a lot of people listening. Ever since that point, however, our show 
has expanded exponentially. Oh, good. And so, um, and, and I'd already explained all that to you. So I wanted you for anybody who's listening to explain to us once again, because you did in the first show, what exactly a flat earth model looks like. Got it. Okay. Flat Earth model looks like, and you guys can look this up, the, the official map projection of the model, you can look it up as the Azimuthal Equidistant Map, and I'll spell it for you. A-Z-I-M-U-T-H-A-L-E-Q-U-I Distant. D-I-S-T-A-N-T. <laughs> right. A Azimuthal Equidistant Map. And you can look that up, and basically what it looks like, it, the, the short version, it's the UN flag. If you've ever seen the UN flag, the North Pole, if you if you take the world and you pretend that it's a dinner plate, that it's actually flat, the North Pole is at the center of that plate. The continents are kind of strewn outwards towards the edge. And the one thing that is missing on the map, and you'll notice this, is Antarctica. Antarctica does not look like an island continent similar to Australia. It is actually a giant landmass that surrounds the entire outside like a giant ring of snow because the first thing is like, whoa, wouldn't the water fall out? Is it? No, no, no. It, the Antarctica is a very interesting continent when you go out there. It's the shoreline is 150, 200 feet straight up of ice. And then it slopes up to almost 14,000 feet and plateaus at 14,000 feet with the exception of the mountains, which go over to 22,000 feet. So the water's not going anywhere. Huh. And the, the continents are the, the way they're, they're laid out actually fit very very well uh, on this map so now in addition to it being flat and i mean it looks like we're still putting the challenge out there to somebody find the curve somewhere not just left and right but forward and back you think you see ships go over the horizon get a cool pix 900 camera with an 80 power zoom and when that ship goes over the horizon why can you bring it back into frame again and again and again until finally the atmosphere gets so distorted that you can never see it remember you're not breathing oxygen you're breathing 80 percent nitrogen that's a whole nother thing for another time on top of all this if the, you want the short version of what this place looks like, it is the Truman Show from 1998. It is a domed stadium. It is a planetarium. It is a terrarium. It is uh, a wildlife preserve, whatever you want to call it. It's an amusement park ride, but it is a, 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 sh a shallow dome. I don't think it's as high as a snow globe. People say, well, it's a snow globe, right? Well, no, it doesn't have to be that high. The, the dome, the firmament the barrier, whatever you want to call it. It could be only a few thousand miles up. I mean, this place is tens of thousands of miles wide at the very least, but the dome doesn't have to be very high because human beings, most 95% of the human population lives from sea level to about one mile up, and that's only 5,000 feet. Airlines cap out at about 10 miles, spy planes, roughly if you believe it, cap out at about 20 miles. That's very, very shallow. So even if the, the dome was only 1,000 miles up, it could easily hold our civilization. And that's what I believe we live in. The, the, the jet stream, which controls the upper atmosphere, runs in a circle. The underwater conveyor system that runs the ocean currents run in a big circle. The magma system runs in a big circle. I say, well, okay, and I, I know I'm jumping around here. What's underneath it? Don't know because the deepest hole ever drilled has only been eight miles. And yet science will tell you when you look in the cross section of any history, uh, any book, science book, exactly what all the bands of, of earth look like all the way down 4,000 miles to the very center, even though they've only drilled eight miles. Hmm. Anyway, so, that's, that's the so, long and short of it. So, and, you, and you've got like, you've got at least one podcast. You've got YouTube channels. I know that you do including ours, a hundred different, um, podcasts, so, uh, interviews. Yep. Um, so what is, once again, what is in this for you as far as talking about this, promoting it, being so hardcore about the flat earth model? Uh, what's the what point? Do I, what do I get out of it? Yeah. And initially it was just trying, I initially put it out there because I'm, I consider myself a really creative problem solver and I thought I could solve this thing. Everybody in the community right now, that gets into flat earth then the t-shirt reads i became a flat earther because i tried to debunk flat earth i tried to debunk it i thought i had it and i didn't in fact not only did i not have it but nine months after i tried to debunk it i ended up started creating youtube videos and i put the question out there and so really you want my motivation it's trying to solve this thing and I've learned by trying to solve it that there was nothing to solve at all it was actually okay how do i prove the globe it's not about the money. It's about 
uh, the greatest the greatest trick of all time and it, it, it is it is so cool to be a part of it because once you learn it you 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 never go back to it i the you gotta remember that the flat earth community has like a 99 percent retention rate people that start off once you start opening the box the pandora's box and look into this you don't go back you never go back now you may fall away from flat earth and say okay i got other things i gotta deal with but nobody goes back to the globe nobody because you can't find it that's how everyone starts everyone that's the challenge i'll put out to anyone that's listening out there try to prove the globe and then if you want to be real, you, you want to have some real, a real challenge, try to prove it without using NASA and see where you end up because you're going to find out that there is, it's really, really thin on the science side. And it was an assumption that was made a long, long time ago. And I'll, I'll end it with this. Here, here's the big question for people. Is science any different from other institutions? Meaning corporate, we all know politicians lie, governments lie, corporations lie, all right? Would science lie to you about this? And you're thinking, no, 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 science doesn't lie about stuff. They're all factual. I'm going, oh, really? It, it, tell me about factual when they rushed products to market like lead paint, lead gasoline, asbestos, DDT. How about the guys, the scientists that took the bribes and told us that cigarettes were safe? If they had a model out there that was 500 years old and science was the ones that figured out that the earth wasn't a globe, would they tell the population? No, they wouldn't. They would treat it like Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they took the Ark, they put it into a crate, they put it into a warehouse, and no one ever talked about it again. Because if it goes against science, science doesn't want it out there. And that's, that's what has happened here. They created a globe model. They figured out it was, it was dead wrong. They were 99% sure it was right. But until you get high enough, until you can get a vehicle high enough to take the picture, what do you really know? When they got high enough, they couldn't figure it. They, they, it was, they were dead wrong. And they said, you know what? We got to keep this thing a secret. It, it would rock the world economically, academically, spiritually. And they didn't know what to do. And so they just held on to it for 60 years. Created NASA. The Antarctic Treaty was put into place. And here we are now with the you know, internet and social media. And the detectionability of the internet has found them out. And it's, it's collapsing as we speak. There you go. That's my rant. <laughs> Chuck, anything you got to add to that? I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. <laughs> All right. right now. Because, mainly because I, my head feels like it's three times its size, too. So. <laughs> well, funny thing is, is it looks three times its size. Yeah, well, <laughs> if, you, if you got a tent stake or something like that, let's see if it explodes. <laughs> um, All right, well... Uh, Honestly, I think that's all awesome, and I think yeah. that's good, good stuff to ponder, um, for sure. Could you tell our guests how to get a hold of you and sure. um, what sure. websites, YouTube channels, books, whatever else you want to? Oh go yeah, ahead yeah, and share? yeah. The the you can just go into any browser and type in Flat Earth Clues. You'll find the YouTube channel, Mark K. Sargent's Flat Earth Clues will take you anywhere. The the book is on Amazon. There it's an audio book. Mm -hmm. There's there's apps. There's a website, MarkSargent.com. What's the What's the name of the book again? Oh, Flat Earth Clues. All right. And it again, don't take my word for it. Do not believe a thing I've said here tonight. Do your own research and ask questions. See where it takes you. Don't think that, oh, this guy's an idiot and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Look, I was, whoever's out there getting angry listening to this, I was just like you. And I was literally banging my head on the keyboard going, it can't be, there's no way, there's no way. This is nuts. We all know it's wrong. The question is, why is this the only thing we debunk to children? Why do we put a globe in the classroom when you're six years old? That's the, it's, it's interesting. And, and that's why you're getting upset. That's why you're mad. It's, you remember the globe. It's like, look, it's my childhood friend. Everyone knows the globe is our home. Is it? All right. so, there you go. All right. Well, thank you for your time, sir. And thank you for coming thank back you. on again. And Thanks, hopefully, guys. yes. Thank you very much as well. Hey, we my, my pleasure. Anytime. Awesome. We will talk to you later, sir. Thank you. All right. See ya.